everyone. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Um, today we're going to talk about iOS 14.5, and I think uh, two major things happened in 2020, um, which is we obviously had the, the huge can pandemic, and then uh, Apple announced iOS 14.5 and upwards. Um, I think it was the beginning of Q3 2020. Everyone went around like a headless chicken, I think, for three months, and thankfully uh, Apple stayed the hand of execution at that point. So. Um, I think that was very, everyone was very grateful for this, um, but come Q2 last year, um, it all went live. So I think it's been on everyone's mind, there's been some big changes in the industry about that, um, and we're here to, uh, to have a, a quick discussion um, about some of the sort of the top line, top line angles of that. So I'm Will, um, I'm VP Sales for Maloco um, here in EMEA. Um, we bring machine learning to businesses, uh, enabling them to leverage their first party data, either for user acquisition or re-engagement, and on the retail side via our retail media platform. Um, so it's great to, great to be here and great to see everyone. Thanks for joining the talk. Um, and these are the amazing panelists. So please introduce yourselves. It would be great to, great to hear from you. Um, and if you can maybe give us a sense of what you might be doing now lockdown is over. <laughs> in my personal life. <laughs> What's uh, hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I am working at an app called Uptime at the moment. Uh, Uptime takes books, courses, documentaries and podcasts and with AI and human curation condenses them down into being five minutes long. Um, my favourite thing that I've been doing since lockdown ended is just going out and having someone else cook for me, like go to a restaurant. Oh, yeah. I was getting a bit sick of my own cooking for a while, so <laughs> over to you. Well, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Dan, so I'm from Cover, which is a flexible car insurance app. So we sell car insurance, everything from one hour to you know, forever with subscriptions, and also we use um, all of the sort of telemetry stuff within your phone to, to allow you to prove us wrong, and we give you a discount on your car insurance effectively. So anyone out there needs car insurance, it's not a bad place to go if you can prove you're a good driver. Um, I think my main thing, it's, it's a massive cliche, I guess, but going out is, is, is the main thing that I think I've enjoyed since lockdown ends. Uh, I've, you know, I've got a, a very frustrated four-year-old at home that obviously was locked up like an animal for probably, you know, a bit longer than she should have been. So I think just going to normal things like the zoo and stuff like that is, is, is great to be able to do again. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm Piyush. I'm uh, a lead growth marketing at Product Madness. It's part of the Aristocrat Group. It has Big Fish and Player my sister companies. That's, the all, that's all the marketing I'll do. Uh, on, the, on the good side, uh, you know, like, uh, I started traveling because I was one of those unlucky ones who sort of came just before the pandemic. So now you, we have some time, so I've started traveling. So that's really fun. Hi, I'm Caitlin Hill. Um, I work for Glorify, which is a Christian app. So what we do is it's about the mindful and connecting to God every day and kind of having that connection outside of church, it's been a really great growth opportunity with lockdown, um, not to ever paint the pandemic as a good thing, but in the sense of having that connection to your faith still, and even though you're not in that physical place, just having that where you can have your daily prayers, where you can have a lot of meditation and mindful content. So it's like a really all-encompassing kind of app. And I lead the performance marketing and the paid ads for the global. So we're quite across kind of the nation and there's a lot of different countries and exciting expansions. And in terms of what I'm happy about doing now that I can do things, probably traveling, because um, all my family live everywhere. Like, um, I'm originally from Canada, so I can't see, in, especially in lockdown, wasn't able to see any of my family, and the only person that I had was up north. So it's just really nice to be able to just see people again in person. Got it. Thanks for the introductions, everyone. So um, I think we can dive in, really. Um, so since Q2, April the 1st, um, what fundamental shifts have you guys seen in the market um, and in whatever order? Yeah, um, I can start, yeah, no, not a problem. <laughs> uh, so honestly, the biggest shift that I've seen uh, in the market has been sort of how we are trying to relook at the budget on iOS specifically. And, the, and you know, because of that, the shift to Android and the increased CPMs on that side, right, from a purely growth marketing. But another shift that I'm seeing, and it is at a very macro level, is you know the bigger companies out there, the Facebooks and the Snapchats and the Twitter, they have now taken the privacy 
uh, you know, very seriously. And they are trying to cut down on the data that is being exposed to the advertisers. This wasn't a shift that happened. This was forced by Apple and Google in a certain sense. But you know, all of a sudden, you got uh, to, uh, TikTok saying that we're not going to pass you view through impressions. You got uh, Facebook saying that you know, we're not going to give you user-level data even on Android. So they're preparing for the world where there will be no user-level data. And they've started doing it right away, given the uh, situation that happened with Apple releasing it uh, you know, at that point in time. So that's one of the biggest shifts that I've seen. And also, you know, uh, the challenge that I'm seeing right now is, again, the data inconsistency in certain sense. Uh, you know, we are, we are in a world which is, right now, it's a transition period, so I wouldn't blame anybody, but it's, it's, it's quite difficult right now to just, you know, look at the data and understand how exactly your marketing is functioning. Uh, and the worst part is, at the, at the core of it, like, we tend to forget this, the users have not changed. They'll still respond to the ad, right? It's not personalized anymore, it's contextual, it's more of a uh, you know, uh, reporting problem that we have seen. And you know, we tend to spend so much money all day that you know, sometimes we don't even understand how much money we're getting back, and that's been quite, quite a challenge, honestly. And I think everybody will agree with that. And what about from a non-gaming perspective, guys? Uh, yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess similar, right? I think, um, I guess, you know, sort of from, a, from a sort of insurance perspective, I mean, we, You've seen that there's certain things that obviously the apocalypse, I guess, didn't come as much as people thought it was like two years ago. Um, and actually, I think um, we've kind of we've kind of gone like a little bit more old school, I guess, in the way that we've kind of measured things. So you tend to look further up the funnel in terms of impact and actually try not to stress yourself, as as, as Pierre says. Like you, the, the data is the data you get is is you know. Is, is arguable most of the time, I think, and I think you've got to kind of like take it a little bit more with a pinch of salt. And we're not in the we're not in the beautiful world that we were a few years ago, where we got everything that many people didn't know about. Um, and I think like we've even done stuff like you know we're sort of preparing ourselves for everything disappearing effectively as time goes on. So we're building out better sort of econometric models and things like that. And actually, I think we I think we know more about the impact of our digital channels as a result. Because I think the thing that you find when you're stuck in a world of just looking at the data is you miss the sort of bigger, broader impact of certain channels. And I think you sort of get stuck in and going, right, well, Facebook's driving this CAC, you know, TikTok's driving this CAC. Whereas actually, you know, when we've turned them off, you see that actually that's not the true impact. It's probably 20, 30, 40% more than, than, than what you see. So actually, I've quite enjoyed it, you know. I've quite enjoyed having less data because actually I think it gets you, it gets you better insight, I think. Dan, you're the only one who enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> leading on from that, I would, leading on from that, I'd say that, you know, looking at your blended metrics, as always, is, is more important than ever. So, like, as Dan says previously, you know, you would be looking at your Facebook CAC and your Twitter CAC and every single thing individually, but now, because we don't have quite as much <laughs> at all visibility, like, you know, we have, it's more important than ever to do incremental testing incre with incrementality, turn, just simply turning things off and on will, will give you a huge, <laughs> like a hugely increased amount of visibility onto things. We did a test in November where we basically just switched off all of our Facebook ads just to see what happened because, you know, because of the lack of reporting, um, we, we weren't sure that, you know, that it was driving as much traffic as we thought. And as a result, when we switched off, like lots of things kind of <laughs> plummeted a lot. <laughs> so now we know never to do that again. Um, and <laughs> keep that on and just keep on doing what we're doing. And then as well as that, just tending towards more a more creative first approach with, so using machine learning and talking to our customers more than ever to understand what their motivators and barriers are and then translating those into the creatives that we're using, so. Well Definitely, and I'm kind of expanding, like looking at the channels, like a big thing um, for myself and working at Glorify and like with strategies is like the way that I would be looking at Facebook and Instagram and from my paid perspective of like hard on acquisition and looking at those KPIs has shifted slightly of how can the paid acquisition support our organic strategy and build up that social? How can we build up emails and actually collect that first person data rather than relying on the third person? Um, third party data. And I think that's been a really key thing is looking kind of, um, like you said, at the blended, because if we're looking at this just from a channel perspective and we have these Facebook costs, but they're boosting, having this impact that where we're having these followers grow and they're engaging and they're sharing their emails and we're able to contact and retarget them, there is a more of a value than just the cost per install kind of a number is. Got it, thanks. 
So we actually touched on a range of different subjects in that, so thanks for that, but maybe we can dig in over the next few questions. Um, I thought that something that was interesting to me was, from our perspective, there were a lot of conversations going on with our clients, um, with product, senior product people, machine learning people, and there was a lot of, we don't quite know what's going to happen, um, we've got to wait and see and adjust. Um, but I'm, I'm interested from your perspective, you guys, as to how you responded, what your strategy was from April the 1st, and how you navigated the ongoing changes operationally. Um, and how that might you might carry what you've seen success in, what you haven't, um, how you might carry that forward. Well, I think as a whole, the industry has gone through five stages of grief, <laughs> really. You know, it was a lot of depression at first. And I think for the most part, we're finally entering acceptance. So the first things that we were doing was just, you know, uh, to begin with, I mean, from April, I mean, the changes happened in April, but we had been testing for months before that because the iOS 14 campaigns on Facebook had, had come out in December, I think, or November before that. So we'd begun testing to prepare ourselves um, in advance of the changes anyway and had been checking attribution windows and things like this to, to set our baselines. Um, so whenever the actual changes came into place, we were pretty well prepared for that. But, you know, the biggest things were making sure that we'd done all of the correct authorization, set up our events in the correct ways. And then the other big thing is just making sure that your web app funnels are are something that you're prioritizing. So as Caitlin said before, you know, collecting email addresses and first party data is very important. Um, I do want to note that obviously with iOS 15, Apple have introduced a hide my email feature. So email validation itself is more important than ever now as well, so that you can make sure people aren't just putting anything in. <laughs> Guys? Yeah, I mean, I guess similar, right? So we had, we kind of had like, I guess we didn't know how bad it was going to get. And I think depending on who you spoke to before before they actually released all the thing, obviously it got pushed back and back and back, didn't it? And I think more people got more and more concerned as it got pushed back and back and back. And I think um, we had kind of like three different approaches we were kind of looking at. We were kind of like, you know, there is going to be no impact right through to we're not going to have any data whatsoever. And we braced ourselves for sort of scales across that. So we had various different models that we built up. We kind of looked at changing the way that we reported on things and actually, you know, less stress around sort of tracking channel performance altogether. Obviously, we did the whole setup of SCAD and things like that. I think, you know, I should probably check there's no one from Apple in the room when I say this, but it's not been the best, really, I don't think. And I think hopefully over time it will improve. Um, but obviously, I think people have started to sort of learn to sort of rely on, on not using it at all, I think, as time has gone on, because I think we've found that, uh, you know, it tracks probably in the low percentiles of, of, of actual performance. Uh, and I think you kind of, you, you're wasting your time if you use that as a, as a sort of metric, I think, is what we've, is what we've found over time. No, uh, just adding on to what Dan and uh, Anna said, right? So at the end of the day, when this thing started uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, literally, <laughs> you know, like it, it really, uh, the first thing that we cared about was the ATD pop-up. Where do we place it? Uh, you know, we thought we'll play around a lot and we started doing a lot of testing. That was back in September 2020 and uh, we started playing with that. And we understood that, you know, given the limitation on the technical side on the initialization of SDK and other stuff, you have to do it at the start of the app and the opening of the app. And we, we sort of did that and we did not see a lot of difference even if the pop-up is coming quite late. And at that point in time, there was no... Uh, uh, the, there was no updated attribution. So that's the first thing that we did. And the second thing we became smarter about was during the transition period, I wouldn't say to all, but specifically to us, because we can, specifically to our genre, which is social casino, uh, we can rely on contextual targeting. Uh, so we sort of moved our internal uh, discussion to blended level metric on iOS specifically, just for the time period, not for always. And during that time, we sort of start, uh, started becoming smarter about conversion value strategy. And I think that's something that I would definitely recommend everybody to focus on being smarter about conversion value strategy because you can extract a lot more information. Look, we are in this world. That world is not going to go away. Uh, you know, like it's, it is what it is. It's 24 hours, 48 hours limitation and the delay in reporting and other stuff. But you can extract a lot more information from the first 24 hours and expand it to, uh, you know, seven days ROS and predicted ROS and other stuff. So... We started becoming smarter about that uh, in certain sense, and uh, you know that's what we learned in the process. That it, uh, it it really helps to you know sort of accept what the situation is, and uh, you know adjust according to it. 
Yeah, um, um, so from my perspective, like, I really love that analogy of the five stages of grief because I think like one of the first hypotheses was really connected to denial. So like on Facebook and Instagram, launching campaigns in tandem to the 14.5 and the ones below, where when we can, when we could, as you know, the adoption rate was kind of just going higher and higher. So the pool of people were getting limited and limited, the costs are just increasing. So it was never going to be a sustainable strategy long term. But it, the idea was to just get as much information as we could get, because it's a really accurate point that in, in theory, a user is not going to be that much different from iOS 13 to 14. They've just upgraded their phone. Their behavior won't necessarily be different. What we can see of it is different. So what can, what can we make from the data that we've seen, from the campaigns, the audience segments that we've been testing? I mean, one thing was that we had to kind of go a bit more towards like the detailed targeting rather than kind of our lookalikes and using um, in-app event-related targeting. But um, even now, that strategy has to alter because with the way that Facebook Facebook's going, and a lot of detail targeting is no longer available, especially in our sector, because religious-based targeting is just no more. So anything to do with like Christianity, which adds like that extra level of difficulty, because it's kind of a sensitive sector, and you don't want to be putting in front of the wrong people, because the reception is going to be really bad. So it's, it's been a lot of just what can we get and where can we learn from there. Other things, kind of a hypothesis I was forming is using the channels like Apple search ads and using what our key keywords were and search terms, kind of like what commonalities can I get from to use that in our creative optimization on socials? Like what are people actually looking for? What features? And using that as a strategy to like map it out in front of as many people. Got it. Thanks, guys. And uh, thanks, audience. Um, I find it hard to read my own handwriting, frankly. And we have some great questions, so you saved me here. Um, we have six thumbs up for a question from Jake, so thank you for that. Um, and it's about how reliable you guys have found your mobile measurement partner at gathering conversion data from SCAD Network. And we don't necessarily need to go into who do you use, um, but let's... Uh, Let's let's see how how has this worked, right? We've got different sources of truth suddenly, and you know what's what's going on here for you guys. Yeah, uh, I can start again. <laughs> no, uh, so look, honestly, when it started, I really thought that MPs are not going to be part of the equation, uh, you know, on the iOS side specifically uh, at that point in time. But the way things shaped up, I think it became quite an important part of the overall equation. So just to answer the question, I think. They are reliable up to the extent that you know they are receiving the data from the networks. So it's the networks that are supposed to pass the correct data to them so that they can show the data and they can enhance the data, obviously, uh, you know, based on whatever, uh, whatever data they are collecting. Uh, the other thing also is I think we have to keep in mind that from IS-15, advertisers can receive the post packs directly. So you can configure uh, you know, at your end if you want to receive the post packs directly, and that would be really, really helpful because you can compare the data. Initially, when this thing started with the MMP, my first hunch was, you know, some of the shady networks might try to change, uh, you know, the conversion value schema and other stuff, conversion value basically in the final outcome because it was going to the networks and networks were going to, uh, you know, to, to, to MP and then MP to us. When we got on a call with Apple at a certain point in time, we literally asked them that we need the postbacks directly. I mean, we were also one of the uh, first ones to actually ask them to get the postbacks directly. And after receiving the postbacks directly, it has really helped because fundamentally, if you look at the data, for example, on Facebook and Google, if you receive the data through MMP, or you know, I'm just saying MMP because if you receive the data from the networks, you're not receiving redownload percentage, you're not receiving a view through uh, attribution, you're not receiving a lot of columns in the raw data itself. While if you're receiving the data directly on IS-15, at least at a broader level, at a media source level, uh, you know, redownload percentage and view through impressions or view through attribution are certain kind of data that. Uh, we are getting, and I'm being very honest over here. I could not be problem for everybody, but in our social casino space, redownload percentage is a big, big problem, and we are facing that right now because the users keep on coming back every six months, eight months down the line, and the definition of redownload has shifted to Apple ID, uh, you know, in certain sense. So it's a lot more strict identifier historically. So you know, a, a lot of users who are even who were considered a new install in the previous. Uh, MMP world is now a redownload technically because it's on Apple ID level. So a lot of these things have changed. I hope I answered the question. I did not take a lot of time, but. <laughs> Caitlin? Yeah, so I mean, my answer kind of varies. 
in terms of, I've worked for a couple of different companies and with Glorify, we have found the data pretty reliable. We have a large volume though. So when I've worked from companies where we don't have that ad spend to be put behind iOS, we're just not seeing any data coming through. It's just a really big difficulty and therefore we can't really, I can't really say how reliable it is if we can't actually see it at all. From a glorified perspective, we take everything from a, with a grain of salt. We validate everything with our internal and see if it matches up correctly. That's something, a big piece we're working with, kind of like our product and analysts are. What make, kind of make rounds can we do? Like, how can we basically like have a lot more reliability in terms of iOS numbers? So that is like a really big ongoing conversation we're actually currently having. And just in terms of our attribution in general, just like, really focusing on the company. Glorify are a relatively new company. They've been around for about a year or so, so it's, we're definitely in that early stages of kind of building that mainframe up. <laughs> I think a lot of things have been said, but, you know, our MMPs are, you know, they've been suffering a little bit too. <laughs> and, you know, the data is some of the most reliable data that you can get from there. But as Piyush says, using the postbacks from iOS 15 can help a lot. And just giving yourself as much opportunity as possible to compare your data and see where things are falling off or, you know, which channels that you can analyze from so many different perspectives, that will really help you. Um, you, you just want to make sure you've got, you know, as many opportunities as possible for success. So I'd say, you know, use your MMP, but also use the postbacks directly too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd agree with, I'd agree with everyone else. I think, um, you know, we use, probably shouldn't say the name, I guess we get in trouble, but uh, we use AppsFlyer, which, you know, there are other MMPs available should anyone want to use them. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, as, as the guys say, like, I mean, an MMP is just a very, very clever cog in the process, right? They, they can only be as good as the data that they get given. Um, so I suspect, you know, they've probably been battered around quite a lot over the last two years with, you know, where's my data, where's it gone? Whereas actually, you know, they can only do so much. And I think we've, we found that yes, the, um, you know, the data has become sort of, like you've got more gaps in it. So you can see things at a channel level that you can't see at an ad level anymore. But and obviously there's more probabilistic matches than there were previously. But um, in the main, the data is you know is, is as reliable as those things can be. And, and like the guys say, like you know, I, I'd recommend to anyone that can that's got the technical abilities to do it is actually take as much data as you can directly and not just rely on the MMP to be your your source of the truth. How do you guys uh, manage iterations? of iOS and changing iterations over time, for instance, enabling view-throughs, um, et cetera, et cetera. What, what does that look like in your BI? Yeah, uh, again, like uh, what happened was it, it all started in a phase-wise manner. And I, I, I don't think we have reached that stage either till now because we started with iOS 14.5, the pop-up happened first, and then it was Scan 1.0, uh, Scan 2.0 technically, Scan 1.0 was launched in 2018. Uh, scan 2.0 and scan 2.0 just had click through conversions and then came another 14.6 and scan 2.2 where you know they introduced view through conversions now the problem is if you look at the publishers some of the publishers are still on still on scan 1.0 uh, sorry 2.0 technically so they're not doing any view through attribution so even if you're looking at the data it's still inconsistent across the board because 2.0 click through 2.2 click through and view through and you know uh, scan 3.0 where some of the networks are receiving dead bean parameter as well, which is pretty handy, you know, just to understand uh, which of the, uh, where exactly your impression is eventually converting. So there is inconsistency in terms of data. And also like when, when you include the IS 15 post packs into the whole equation, uh, starting with like, when you look at the overall data, you're receiving one source of data from 14.5 and above, uh, which is sort of incomplete because a lot of partners are not sending complete data, but there is no matching key between 14.5 to 15, and that is a big, big problem because what 14.5 is exposing, uh, you know, technically is the campaign ID is coming from, let's say the nine campaign IDs that we set up on Facebook because that's Facebook limitations. But what we're receiving on IS15 are all the 100 campaign IDs and we can't make sense of it. So even if those two different data sources are coming, at a broader level, it's still helpful, but you can't extrapolate more information from that in certain sense. Any other thoughts from you guys? 
through it. So then, I guess, in terms of navigating the change, we've covered this. Um, and then something that was touched on was re-downloads. Um, is there a strategy you're employing to sort of manage this sort of opacity? <laughs> These are very hard questions. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, with re-downloads, I mean, whenever you're, if you, re-downloads is something that has been, re-downloads are something that whenever you're switching to any new MMP or any new platform, that's something that you have to incorporate into your planning anyway. So let's say today someone had no MMP and they went to AppSlayer. Every single person who downloaded or updated the app would count as a fresh download into AppSlayer. They, they would all be new acquisitions. So these are things that we've had to think about for a long time beforehand, um, or, or any other MMP, of course. Um, but with you know, with the changes and with re-engagement, re-engagement as a whole is another thing that's made harder than ever. So we need to think about different ways to to tackle that. So sending people more and more through the website, as I say, just directing a lot of traffic to the web, retargeting people, and also just making sure that the content that you're putting out there as a whole is is valuable, so that you can have you know online and well, within the app, eco within your app, Facebook UA ecosystem, but then within the other touch points that you're having through social media or blog content and things like this too. That you and another thing to note is with re-engagement, making sure that the um, journeys that your customers are having within your product are better than ever, and that you're nurturing them more than ever too. So, making sure that your comm slows are very on point. You know that you again. I will always say like that you're speaking to your customers and making sure that what you're saying is thing, are things that make sense for them too. Dan? Yeah, I, I guess similar really. I think, um, you know, it's one, of those, it's one of those problems you'll always have, I guess. I think we, two years ago, we were, we were an app. We didn't have a website other than to tell people we had an app. And I think over the last sort of two years, we've, um, you know, we've had to readdress that because it doesn't just help from an acquisition perspective. But also, it's not a bad thing to have another place for someone to to purchase from you but I think over over time we've kind of looked at we've we've always had you know as a company we've always we've always wanted like transparency and things like that to, to sort of kick in as quickly as it can and and we're in a lucky world where like everyone uses our app has to have a user account so we sort of don't have any blurriness before that stage which is which is you know quite fortunate I guess in this world but it means that we can we can sort of funnel people into more sort of CRM activity and stuff like that, where we actually manage re-engagement and we actually try to allow them to do stuff on their own on their own terms rather than us just sort of you know trying to sort of bombard them all the time off the platform. Yeah. So um, w one big thing that I was kind of thinking a uh, point I touched on before is in terms of like lead generation and like how we can actually have that first party data and launching like especially on Facebook we have the in-app kind of lead gen forms that we can populate and really utilize that data and in terms of even broadly in your creative strategy seasonality feature based like creative strategy obviously when we can't exactly know on these platforms whether it's going to be a new returning what um, identifier having really shouting out about what is great about the app now because the likeliness is there are going to be people that have either had it they know your brand and they want to they want to know why it's better now why should i have it now if i had it before and i didn't like it we have to really think about like the broader picture in terms of re-engagement as well as like from that first party data, what can we do with like our custom audiences and things like that whilst we, again, like whilst we still have that capability with Facebook because as, um, as you said before with iOS 15 and the randomized emails, it's becoming like even more difficult to track people down. So again, kind of just links with the brand strategy as well. Having a really good brand and organic image has become so important because they need to be able to trust you at the end of the day. A big thing is like, understanding why we even have this tracking issues and this privacy is because from a non-marketing point of view, they think that we can see everything and it's like a big invasion of privacy. Whereas from our perspective, we're just trying to retarget a product that we know you're going to be interested in. So it's about really establishing that trust between your user and your company. I mean, I think at the end of the day, uh, we are receiving a lot of free downloads, uh, right? So what we did, I mean, I think she's absolutely right. One thing that we also did was change our creative strategy. When you're speaking to the customers now, it's not purely because there is no suppression. I mean, there is suppression, but it's only 20% of the users. 
we always used to live in that world if you think about it because LAT was also not giving you, uh, you know, at a certain point in time, there was not giving you device ID. So we always had a non-suppression uh, iOS campaigns running. But this time what we've done is we're trying to change our creative strategy, speak to both re-engaged users and the new users through just one creative medium because we don't know where we're going to land up uh, in this world. And then, you know, like the whole flow, that, look, there are three things that we can control essentially. One is contextual targeting. The other is the creative that is speaking to the consumer because think about it from a user perspective, that's all they care about, the creative right there. And the third is the landing page. Now, if these three are in sync, you know, like, for example, we show a Buffalo creative, uh, you know, Buffalo coin creative over there in the, in the creative, and if the landing page is also speaking about the same thing, then it gives you a lot more uh, sort of uh, chances of the user converting at the end of the day. So being smarter about these three things and sort of uh, taking that into creative strategy as well, I think that has helped. Got it. Um, can you scroll back up again? We had a, a popular question about optimizations um, and how you're currently handling optimizations, uh, whether it's weekly, where are we? From Anonymous, thank you. Um, yeah, if you're relying more on econometrics, um, and what would you recommend to ensure activity is still effective right now? In terms of creative optimizations, I suppose. Um, yes. For for us, we are always with our with our creative strategy. We're going down two routes. So we're either introducing new creative directions or doing optimizations on creatives that we've already seen working. So if we're starting right from the beginning, what we do is split out four or five, uh, th well, three or four or five different creative directions based on motivators or barriers. Run that as an A/B test to see which one is kind of the strongest what creative direction to go in, take that and then start iterating on that. Um, once we've done that, you know, you can run that process again and again um, and you start to build your headline uh, campaign, your headline creatives within your campaign. With my main campaigns, I try to touch them as little as possible and I do my testing outside of the campaigns to add them in. Um, once I know that they're going to work, I don't like to add in a brand new creative that's never been touched or seen before into a, into a campaign that's, you know, a headline campaign um, because, you know, you have it paused, they have it, you know, in review for a couple of moments. <laughs> so, you know, just, I, I'm more constantly testing new new creatives anyway, every week, every, many, many, every month um, and across every, every single different channel as well. Um, I think it's also interesting to test out different cre creatives that are working on different channels. So with TikTok, for example, um, we had tried out some creatives that had worked on Facebook on there, didn't work. So now we're trying out creatives that worked on TikTok on Google, for example, and they're doing incredibly. Um, so you can take learnings from one and apply it to the other with a pinch of salt sometimes too. Yeah, I think, um, I guess in terms of approach, like it's probably not really changed that much. I think with optimization, I think it's important, especially creative optimization, it's important to remember what it is you're trying to affect when you make the change. So is it you're trying to increase click-through rate on a particular ad? Are you trying to target a different audience? Are you trying to try a different platform? Um, and I think from that, we kind of, we've, we've, we've always adjusted what KPIs we put against the success metric of each one. So I think if you're looking at pure A-B testing on creative within a platform that you know works, you know the performance of the platform, Regardless of whether you're using econometrics or you know using the MMP, you'd kind of you'd look at things like click-through rate, you'd look at engagement, and all of that stuff's still available. So it doesn't really change much. It's more just when people get through the funnel, that's when things get a little bit blurry. But you can kind of see whether you're having an impact uh, at the point that's the most important, anyway. To be honest. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll segregate this question into two parts. One is on self-reporting networks and the other is on non-self-reporting networks. On non-self-reporting networks, you're still receiving probabilistic data. So not much has changed. You're still receiving all the data points, D7 ROAS, D7 revenue and other stuff. I mean, I live in a world of in-app purchase, so that's why I keep on referring to revenue. Uh, but yeah, so on the SRN side, I think things have changed drastically because there are a lot of, you don't have a lot of levers available. Like, I mean, you have only have... Uh, creative more or less to play around with and being smarter about conversion value strategy. If you're smart about your conversion value strategy, you will extract a lot more information. And again, uh, creative will also speak for you. And I think those are the two major things. I think we're short on time, so. Um, 
So to save just repeating what other people said, I really agree with the cross-platform strategy with creatives. I really love doing that, and especially like uploading onto YouTube. I find that works really well with just even short Facebook, Instagram creatives. One thing that I really look into is kind of like how we sh um, market differently to iOS and Android in general, and like those creative strategies. So we do a lot of customer segmentation and like talking to our users. And like one thing is just straight up asking what Android device you use before, and then all of that information you can relate back obviously from single people but to an OS device so kind of the struggles that they're having and things like that so looking for pain points of why they would be using glorify for example and then using that in your creative strategy god we hit zero um, <laughs> thanks audience for all your questions it's great to have so much interaction and to our panelists thank you for sharing and for being here really appreciate it thank you.